see a beautiful woman here today. I am just going to introduce myself once again. Some of you know who I am already, and some of you don't. So, and I'm going to be reading just a bit because I want to be clear and concise, and I don't want to, you know, confuse anyone. So I'll be sticking to what I wrote here. So I'm Sharda Lasala. I'm 26 as of today. I am. Happy birthday! Today Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm the wife of an evangelist and a mom to four young children. I know you're probably wondering where on earth am I from and why I'm in Corsicana. So I'll give you a brief summary. I am from the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And when I was 21, I met my husband, who is on my ministry. He had a vision of what God wanted him to do, and I had mine. And eventually, we got married, and we moved to Corsicana because we wanted to start our own ministry here. It was, we liked the town. It was convenient. It was, it, we had everything we needed here. And it was a great place, we thought, to raise our children, so it was a blessing to find this place. It's been five years since, and as a young wife, I've learned a lot from trial and error, and at times, complete failures along the way. When misunderstandings between friends from different cultures and problems in my marriage arose, I just did what I knew best. I flipped out. <laughs> I lost it. And um, I did that every time. I didn't have many people close to me to guide me or show me what to do or how to fix my relationships. I always blamed everyone else. Really, it was never my fault when something happened. My, relation my relationships were quickly falling apart. I needed help and I needed it fast. So, I did what any Christian would do. I started to pray. But mind you, I started to pray against everyone. <laughs> and it was pretty bad. But God started to work in me, and eventually he lifted the veil bit by bit until I could notice my own behavior. And with a lot of deliverance, I finally realized that I needed to submit myself to God for him to change me. I was on the chopping block this time, and I needed him to help me understand. And here I am today with all that he has taught me. I'm sharing it with you ladies because I know that there are areas in our lives where we need to apply wisdom and understanding and true love to get the most out of every relationship God has blessed us with. And to ensure that the relationships most dear to us will last a lifetime. So, before you leave, I intend to help you understand how to improve relationships by finding yourself, and this is the bulk of my presentation, to strengthen communication and understanding between the sexes, which is going to be a result of what we discussed today and to help you showcase all of this the way God designed it. We will talk about self-awareness, true love and responsibility, fear and insecurities, and finally, effective communication. But first, I would like to get to know you all. So, we're going to play a little game, have some fun with each other. Here I have a 
big wall of candy. Not too good for us, but it's for our game. Okay. Each type of candy has a question assigned to it. And since there's there's enough questions for each one of you, four questions. So everyone will take one piece of candy, any type that you like. And then I will read the question assigned to the piece of candy. Okay, so I'll start. I'll start here. So I can do the Snickers too, or is it? Is it? That'll be different questions. Right? Different questions. Okay, I will choose wisely. <laughs> Does anyone have Twix? No one chose Twix. <laughs> All right, M&Ms. Your question is, what best describes your personality? I'll give you time to think. And you can tell us your name and tell us what best describes your personality. Milky Way. Milky Way. <laughs> Your question is, are you nervous? Why or why not? I'll give you time to think about it. Snickers. These are my questions. Okay, I'll give you two different okay. questions. <laughs> okay, your question is, how do you express your love? And your question is, what are two things that you really want to do in life? that excite you when you think about it. So I'll give you time to think, and then I'll start at the lady at the back. <laughs> Who will come and collect it? I'm an order person. Like, um, I like things um, in order, not scrub all with. <laughs> Organized, cool, and calm. Collect. When I say cool, calm, and collect yes. all uh, even though I'm upset, a lot of times, even though I'm upset, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I'm upset, a lesson is, you know, me, sometimes me can make you act a little different, but that's why, you know, basically, or whatever, you know, can, can make you act different, but basically, I, I mean, whatever I'm trying to deal with, I'm trying to deal with, I ain't always going to do that, but I am, right now, you know. I believe in God and uh, I believe in Okay. So, how do I show my love? Yeah. Now, can you be more specific? Is it for everybody or just certain people? Or How do you express your love when you care about someone? Ah, gotcha. And I guess really that thing to me is sort of the same for everybody. So, for me, it's an act, love is an action word. Yes. So I would definitely want to show that I love somebody by treating them the way I would want to be treated. So, you know, God says, you know, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors, you love yourself. So for me, it would be an action word of whatever they need at the time. You know, and I'm going to express that through some type of an action. Like we have a lady in our development, she lost her husband. I made sure that she got a card, sent the mail, and that she needed assistance with anything. I'm always trying to be aware of uh, how people are doing it at a given time and just love them that way by expressing that someone cares. Share it with us. Two things that I would like to accomplish. Yeah. What, what excites you when you think about that? Two things in mind. Yeah, um, well, my name is Julie, and um, I am excited because I want to. Uh, start being more communicative with people, um, kind of break out of my shell and um, like express and like share, share God and stuff, you know, um, things that I've learned, like in deliverance and healing. Um, I just want to be able to, you know, get people excited about that, you know, because it's just so exciting when they just open their eyes and realize like behind the, the veil that they can't see what goes on. You know? Yeah. Um, that really excites me to be able to do that. I just need to break out of my shell. So that's what I need. Mean. <laughs> and I'm talking now that like at work and stuff, I'm very quiet. You're doing pretty good right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and then another thing I just would like to be able to, because I do work at a hospital, and, and I would love to be able to, to 
heal something. You know, like Jesus being able to work yes. and heal. Yes. That just really kills me that people think that could be possible. So I'm just looking forward to that. That's good. That's great. Are you nervous? Why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am nervous. Um, I feel like I. I think I, um, I think I like hold on to like my failures and like when I sin, I keep like replaying it, you know, and I, I don't really let it go. And um, it kind of, I kind of walk around, you know, feeling like, oh, I, I, I'm just a failure, you know, like, because I can see, you know, every day, you know, like things that. You know, I sin things that I do wrong, and then I repent. But then I, I don't let it go. You know, I just feel horrible about it, and then I feel like you know I'm horrible. Which, I mean, it is true because you know God is the only good thing in me. But I guess I have to remember that you know I do have God in me. You know? We're gonna cover a lot of what you're talking about today, and I hope that it helps you. I don't want you to go through this in your mind because it's not healthy and I don't think God would want us to be suffering mentally like that, you know. So we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But we're going to start at self-awareness. So that's going to be the first topic that I'm going to cover now. I'm going to do a bit of breathing too, okay? So please excuse me for this. The first topic, self-awareness. Now before we think about communicating effectively or about understanding others, it's important to look at ourselves. I know this can be scary for some of you, and especially what you were talking about. Sometimes you can end up blaming yourselves when you really look into what's inside of you or the things that you don't want to do that you keep doing, what we call, you know, sin and whatever else. It's scary, but you need to have a healthy balance in Christ, okay? It's scary, but it's a key factor in moving forward in Christ with boldness as women. Self-awareness is different to pride. It doesn't require us to think highly of ourselves above measure like the self-love movement is promoting today. It's different. Self-awareness helps us to think soberly. That's a biblical concept for women to be sober-minded. To be honest with ourselves about who we really are and what we struggle with and how to change those habits that we have become aware of. The Bible says the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. So, then pretending to be what we are not is in a way deceitful. And when we don't look at ourselves and be honest with, with ourselves, we are living in deceit, basically. It's something we eventually grow into through consistent self-evaluation. The Bible says counsel in the heart of man is like deep water but a man of understanding will draw out that counsel. So the Word of God teaches us, especially us ladies, to be sober-minded. How can we use the quality of sober-mindedness to find ourselves? I have a few points here. I'll read them to you. We can be slow to speak. This helps us to observe our emotions as it's happening. Maybe you're angry, or you're frustrated, or nervous. But if you're slow to react, you have time to observe 
people's emotions on a deeper level. Be aware of how thankful we are for everything we have and experience in life, especially when we're not happy. When we're not happy, it's a good time to go through thanking God and, and really thinking about all the things we have. Even if, even if it's the smallest thing, He has given it to us. He has allowed it to happen for us. Let's observe our attitude from a third person point of view. Let's learn what our body responds to best. Take care of yourselves in order to be able to give of yourself. Let's practice embracing and connecting to our nurturing side more often. This is something that we really struggle with as a society in this time connected to our nurturing side because we have to, we feel that we have to be tough and step up with every experience we have with someone or they'll just roll over us, they'll steamroll us as they say, you know, but we need, it's important to connect to our nurturing side. Focus on being instead of doing for the most part of your day. This means you value the moments that you're in. Sometimes we miss our moments because we're too busy thinking about what you're gonna do next. And though it's good for productivity, it's, it's not healthy for us to be in that state of doing, doing all the time. Learn to switch blame and frustration off and replace it with appreciation and under pressure. And the last point, be aware that no one accepts anyone for who they really are. This is a big one that a lot of us as a society, and I had to learn to, to understand this too, that no one is gonna accept you for who you really are. We're all human. We all have preferences, we all have different experiences in life, and you're always going to find something wrong with somebody. It's just normal, you know? Therefore, you must learn to appreciate your own feminine energy and maintain that. It's the best way to be happy within yourself without needing people's approval or for someone to say, I love you feel better, okay? So let's take some time to answer some questions and we can share them in our group. And it will help us to practice being real with each other and give us an idea of how to practice self-awareness when we're at home, okay? So I have a board here. And it says, <laughs> kickstart self-awareness. Self-evaluation. So I have a bunch of questions and I'm going to give you some time to really think about them and maybe you can write your responses and share it afterward. The first one is think about all the interactions you've had with other people, especially the ones that got you upset. <laughs> Look at yourself from their perspective. What do you see about yourself when you do that? Many times we look at the other person, we find everything they did wrong. But we're going to change that just this moment. And imagine the situation happening. But look at yourself from an outside point of view. Observe yourself having that fight with the other person. What do you see about yourself that you could have changed? The next question is, what is your true nature like? Who are you really? What is your nature? Our sister here said she's cool, calm, and collective. She knows her nature. Right, right. Well, 
this is a good opportunity to think deeply about it. Is your nature, um, are you really inside? Are you gentle? Are you a, a feminine person? What is your nature like? What is your feminine nature like? How can you develop your nurturing qualities? What do you think you can do to make, to be more aware of being more nurturing to other people? The next one is, how can I practice being more present, living in the moment a little bit? Maybe you're, uh, most of you have children, maybe your child says something funny, but because you're thinking about doing another meal, you're like, okay, that's funny, you know, and you just move on. But what if you actually stayed in that moment and enjoyed it? and laughed and just put everything else down for a minute. Awesome, that's good. Awesome. <laughs> the next point, ways I can switch from my frustration off. What are some ways that we can, when we're under pressure, when we're frustrated, we can come out of that situation, calm down, diffuse, Anything that you think about, you can write it down. So I'll leave this here. I hope that you can see. You know, I've learned that in the time I did this. Uh, when I was younger, my way of the house. <laughs> they didn't even know where to rent. <laughs> but, you know, over a period of time, you know, I've always been raised in church, and I love, I love church and stuff. And as a Christian, you grow up from day to day, and you get to win sometimes. And I'm in the program called Celebrate the Cup, and I am a leader. And um, I tell my ladies that um, when, when I'm talking to you, I, I'm not no different than you are. When it comes to uh, human life, I make mistakes. So don't think that I'm I'm better than you or worse than you. Just think that I'm trying to learn stuff just like you. I just have to be in league. Yeah. And I'm um, reading God's word and um, accepting one day at a time, uh, one minute at a time. Most people don't understand that you can go through a whole day not not accepting anything positive. You know, but learning to live in minutes, a happy in a minute, happy in two minutes, three minutes, so you can get 365 days. You know, I don't worry about the things around me as yeah. much as I used to because I'm in your mind to vanish. Tomorrow's not promised, and yesterday's gone. I've already lost it, but today's the most important day. That's right. Um, what is your true native? Nature. Nature like crazy. But <laughs> loving, crazy, you know, and um, I'm a peculiar person, but I'm a person that that loves to see people happy. Loves to, you know, I love I love to go out and do things, adventures and stuff. And I love my kids to be in educating herself. Yes. I'm not going back to school, but I've done all I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm up in age now. And I told my kids, if I didn't do what I need to do, and I miss something in you find it for my grandkids. <laughs> and you make, the, you make the gene, you know, you make the next generation, you know, because I come from, where I come from, is a little bit different than where they come from. Right. Even though you may have experienced some of the same thing, but in our country, you know, in the United States, in our lives, uh, that's why we have generations. That's why we have history. And some people focus on what what somebody else's history is, and they're upset. Yeah. Why not focus on your history? That's how you get through the moment, the days, and all of that. Because we all have things that, that we say that we read. We all have things that um, happen to us, secrets and lies. You know, and I like the answer to it. I like the answer. You don't always get an answer. That was my frustration. I asked you a question, I want that answer. Because it, it affects me. <laughs> and 
And uh, my mom said that whatever I haven't said or haven't done or did do, I'm going to my grave with it. I said, well, did you didn't answer the question. I said, yes, Satan wants to keep us trapped That's by right. believing lies and believing things. But when you speak it out, like we're going to hear, and have a sister pray for you, take yeah, someone out of the field. Take someone out of the field. And um, he doesn't have any power at all. You don't give him power. Yeah. Yeah. Does it hold on to him? That's right. I don't really break it down. Yeah. It's like, uh, I've heard your husband say it's like a kryptonite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once you forgive somebody, the devil can't work for you. All right. This takes us to the second topic of our um, discussion responsibility. Many people usually interpret the act of being responsible with blaming themselves when something happens. And this one's for you, sister, so I hope that this helps you. Blaming yourselves when something happens. We need to understand that taking responsibility does not mean that we need to blame ourselves. Because blaming ourselves never leads to a process of transformation in our lives. What it does is it feeds our insecurities. The act of being responsible involves to never blaming anything anyone else for anything you are being, doing, having, or feeling. So you don't blame yourself and you do not blame others. Because being responsible for your emotions and the way you feel and what you experience is your it's, it's your sphere of it's your experience. You control you can control that experience by not blaming other people, okay? I'll explain this a little more. Responsibility is an act that is empowered by what we just talked about, self-awareness, self-evaluation. It helps us to be responsible. You become aware of where and when you are not owning up to your own actions and reactions so that you can make change possible. Okay? Responsibility is a voluntary act. We choose to be responsible. It's something you have to choose to do. It is the ability to respond to the needs expressed or unexpressed of another person. And you were talking about that with the card when someone was, um, one of your friends was sick. That was an act of love and your responsibility as a child of God. You notice that um, that emotion, that need, express or unexpress, and you respond to it. That's good. <laughs> Let's look at a scenario and try to figure out how both people can practice being responsible. So this scenario is going to be about a married couple, Jane and Joe. Jane and Joe are married and they have a son. Jane decides to cook a lovely dinner for Joe. After being home all day catering to every need of their child. Despite being very exhausted, Jane chooses to be thoughtful. She wants to make her husband a nice meal. So she, sac she sacrifices, they would say. You sacrifice your, your peace, or joy, whatever else to make this person happy. We're going to talk about that too. She waits patiently for Joe to come home so she can share how her day went. So we see now that there's a motive. She wants Joe to listen. <laughs> Joe comes home, he settles down to eat, he shows no interest in what anything Jane is saying, and he delivers a disappointing announcement. The meal is not one of his favorites. 
Jane has an emotional meltdown, and this would have been me if I was in this position. <laughs> she goes on to tell Joe he's an insensitive and selfish jerk. How can Jane and Joe communicate responsibly next time? You can give me a few of your ideas, but I do have a board prepared. Does anyone want to? From which side? The Joe's or Both. Jane's? Both. Who do you think was wrong? I, I don't like the idea of doing something, expecting something in return. A lot of people do that, and there are people who just do from the heart. They don't worry about what's next. You know, I, I guess I'm that kind of person. Yeah. If I do something for you, I'm not expecting something. But sometimes we're human, and 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 and, and it's it's our nature as women. Yeah. We like when you pay attention yeah. to what we do. Yeah. <laughs> and to cook a dinner and 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 say all that. Not too hard, is it? You know, I, I don't do that. Yeah. You know, me or me would. <laughs> Okay, and then I won't be there no more. <laughs> but you know, you learn in relationships that um, it's a give and take. Yes. But to sit down and talk about the issue, uh, sometimes people don't want to do that. But I found that talking about the issue, the real issue, and being able to accept the answer, if you're going to ask the question, and you can't accept it. Why do you walk with that? That is, that is beautiful. <laughs> that is beautiful. Even though it's not what you want to hear, accept it. It is what right. it is. That's from the heart. Yeah. You know? And Jane, and Jane doesn't know, she knows her day, but she doesn't know Joe's day. Yeah. So when he sits down, she should have, she could have said, hey honey, how was your day at work? And let him, she, he might not have wanted to share anything. Absolutely. And then he would have opened up dialogue and then the piece quiet she's like well let me tell you about my day <laughs> yeah. if you don't mind yeah. listening i'll share with you yeah. or would you rather sit here in silence you know give people options oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, then, and then for joe he probably that was not a good time to mention it wasn't his favorite meal yeah. attitude of gratitude and yes. then later on he could have said hey by the way if you don't mind fixing me dinner, um, here's a list of things I really, really like. And we can go shopping for these items. Exactly. Yeah. You're a communication yeah. expert. Yeah. <laughs> I've been working on it since I was five. <laughs> I have, I have some, of, I have some of my um, responses. I'll share them with you. So I separated them. This is Joe. Okay. And this is Jane. Jane has a lot of problems. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Jane has a lot of problems. <laughs> Joe, this is what he can work on. He can find a good way to communicate his perspective to Jane that will reassure her, which is what our sister Carol was saying too. He can express to Jane that he loves her, he really cares, but he had a long day and he needs some quiet time. Or as most guys say, I need to go into the man cave, they call it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then when a man just sits there in silence, like he probably was not listening, it really does make, make the woman feel like he doesn't care. That's right. And it might have just because he's had a long day and he's like, he's quiet. He's just zoned, and he's zoned out. He's right. Well, for Jane, we're going to put her under the category of first self-evaluation that we spoke about. Because this fixes a lot of our communication problems as women. Jane needs to be more responsible with her emotions and reactions. Jane didn't stop. She didn't stop to process how she was feeling. She didn't stop to think about how she would respond. She just did it. And for a large portion of my married life, I just did it. Just like Jane. She got me into a lot of trouble. Jane can learn to prioritize her activities during the day 
so that she will be happier and won't need Joe's validation. Jane could have probably took some time, put a show on for the kids, did her hair, put on something nice, fill her own tank of happiness before she responded to Joe. Another thing Jane could have done when we look at prioritizing activities, Jane could have said, oh, I want to make Joe happy today. So what I'm going to do is not give from my empty tank. I'm going to go to the store and buy his favorite stoppers. <laughs> Put it in the oven and Joe is happy. Okay? <laughs> Jane can look at things from Joe's perspective and imagine how he's feeling, being considerate. And Sister Carol said this, that she could have been more considerate. Jane can't regulate her own emotions and the feelings of unappreciation by communicating her disappointment without having a meltdown. She can tell Joe she understands but just needs him to listen to how her day went after day. Letting him know that all she needs is for him to listen and nothing more. I think most times when we communicate with men, uh, well, men like to fix things. And every time we open our mouths, they are ready to fix what comes out of it. So I feel like if Joe had a long day, the first thing he thought when Jane started talking about her day, oh no, look at all these things I have to fix. I'm tired. And I, I don't like the meal either, so <laughs> you know, it's pretty hard for me. So she can communicate more clearly, and it's something that all of us can do if we have a male figure in our life or male friends or you know husbands whatever it is we tell them exactly what we want from them can you please just listen you don't have to do anything you don't have to fix anything i just need you to listen and they'll be like okay then you can go on with everything you have to say that's so true you know? and you have to probably almost say it every time Yes. <laughs> really? Because, you know, you just can't say it once and then they're going to understand that. Because then they're not going to know, well, am I supposed to fix it or to listen? Yeah. You know, to yeah. Every time. So every time, you know, I just need you to listen. While well, the time is yeah. important for, for each of you, know, each of you. Because as you live in other than Rook, you learn what each other likes to do. Too much is, you know, I always believe that a house that lasts too much is not good. But a house is too loud, it's not good. Yeah. You know? So, and, and I like doing family things with, you know, my family, but I also like leaving time. I have a room in my house that's all about me. They say, why is this one chair in here? This is about me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to um, round up responsibility. We can be responsible for the emotions we feel by practicing what we spoke about first, self-awareness. Observe those emotions. Ask ourselves why we feel this way. Identify the feeling as one that is not of God because the reactions you feel are sometimes not of his nature at all. No one is responsible for making us happy. I think Valerie made that really clear to us. No one's responsible for making us happy. Valerie has her space set up. We, when we initially meet someone, we bring our own happiness to them. And somewhere along the way, after knowing the person for a while, we kind of get lazy with it. Our love becomes conditional and we shut the tap off. No free or flowing love now. You need to put in work to get it. Happiness doesn't depend on even who you're married to. 
We could be married to anyone and learn to make it work when we are responsible. Because now we're not focusing on what the other person is doing, but we're focused on us and what we can do to solve situations and to better ourselves and the way we react when that time comes. You know? People think that if they are not happy with their partners, they can easily trade him or her out for a new vehicle that brings more excitement. <laughs> but they end up just as miserable with the next person. If we want to grow in love, we need to learn to cultivate our own happiness and not depend on other people to meet our needs. I'm going to share a story with you about my marriage. Now, my husband's name is Chris. And when we first got married, we were two very different people. I mean, we were still in the process of becoming one flesh. I was used to, I'm from the Caribbean, so I'm used to very, uh, you know, the men there are usually outgoing and the romantic types. My husband is Italian-American, and he was totally different from anyone that I've ever met. So, I would nag him over and over again. Why don't you ever bring me some flowers? What about a card now and then? You know, Flowers, please. <laughs> so one day, he actually, I don't know what happened. I think maybe because I cleaned the house and everything was in order and it was great. I lit a candle, you know. Things were looking good. So he left and he came back with flowers. Now you would expect that I'd be excited about this, but <laughs> I was not. I was not excited, in fact, I was really, really angry. And I was angry because the first thing is, I had nagged him to do this for a long time. And now it felt like he was doing it just because I requested, not because he wanted to do it of his own choice. <laughs> so I started to get upset, and I turned to him and I said, Oh, so you, you brought me flowers because I asked for it? <laughs> the, the, the answer was yes, you know, <laughs> you wanted flowers, so I brought it. And that's an example of what happens and how you feel the love is not reciprocated when we just expect people to make us happy. I felt like I was putting a burden on him, saying, okay, I'm not happy because you're not being a certain way. And we all know that when you love, it produces more love, and in this case, it didn't. So I had to learn to be responsible for filling my tank up, cultivating my own happiness, being responsible that way, and then my husband eventually followed without me having to nag him. So that's just a, a situation that I went through earlier in my marriage. And this brings me to the next point. Being responsible also means we can learn to be more considerate and receptive, open to love. In that story I told you, I was not open to love when I should have been. And we also need to learn not to point the finger, and this will help us to do that effectively. Okay, so we did go through ways that we can cultivate happiness. Um, we talked about me time and all these things. So I would like when you go home to think about ways that you can cultivate your own happiness. Things that you can do to fill yourself up so that you can give to other people and be more open to love and receptive when people show you love. 
we're going to move on to the third topic. Let's look at true love. What is it really? And this is going to be very, very interesting. True love is exactly what we develop when we become self-aware and responsible. So we did it in order. Now we're moving to what it produces. Because growing in those two areas requires a lot of work. When you love, you will labor for that person you love to grow or for that relationship to bloom. That's just how it works. Love and labor go together. And here are a few examples of that, the laboring kind of love. The first example is the relationship between mothers and babies. I don't want to say young children, specifically mothers and babies. A mother labors for that baby and is responsible for caring for the baby, and the baby is loved. That love then produces more love. Because the baby is loved, it shows the mother that it loves her by cuddling and smiling and giving the googly eyes and all that. This is an example of infantile love. It's the kind of love that says, I love you because I am loved. <coughs> Mommy, I love you because I need you. But it is not the type of love we should have as adults. It's a dependent kind of love. It is naturally one-sided and often leaves the giver drained of all their liveliness. If you are a mom or ever cared for lots of children, you will feel this draining type of love. It feels like it's take, your kids are taking it all out of you at the end of the day. Sometimes our love towards God is this kind of love because we are children to Him. He is our Father. I think when we see Him as He is, one day, we will have a different kind of love and reverence for him. But that's just my opinion. The second relationship is the one between men and a woman. Usually, whether they are married or not, a man has a deep-seated urge to labor for women. We can clearly identify this as a type of love. We see it in many biblical accounts. Jacob loved Rachel, so he worked seven more years. For me, my husband gave pretty much all his earnings to get me into the states closer to him. For many of you, if you have relationships, your partners go to work to support you in some way or show you that they are fit and deserving in some sort of way. You know, I don't even believe that men naturally like working. I don't, I, I don't think that they think it's exciting, but they do it for their families because they love. That's their way of showing it. Sometimes we find the unhealthy type of love between men and women. And this kind of love says, I love you so that you can serve me. Or, I love you because you serve me. The third type of relationship is the best one, yes. The relationship between us and God. Now you know this is a perfect kind of love. There's a lot to say about this. and. There's a lot we can learn about loving the right way from God. And if true love produces more love, then we can change the people around us just by being a person that really loves in truth. You know, we don't have to do anything else, but by the Bible says you can change someone by example to a woman, right? 
So this is perfectly biblical. Have you ever wondered why God loved some people in the Bible despite the things they did? Look at David, a, a man after God's own heart. He did many things, made many mistakes, God still loved him. Sometimes I wonder, you know, but it's a perfect example of true love. God didn't love because he was compelled to love or had selfish motive to love, or to love to get some praise in return. He just chooses to love. He's God, he does whatever he wants. God doesn't love us and feel miserable about it as if we're depriving him of his own joy and happiness. He loves from his own essence. He can love like no other human being because he is that love. He is the I am. He is being in love and doing in love simultaneously. He also rebukes and corrects us through the same love, which is something only he can do perfectly. Because when we try to correct or rebuke people, you know, you don't get a good reaction. We don't, we don't always do it perfectly, but God can because he does it in love. And whatever comes from that, uh, from his frustration or anger with someone always produces more love in the end. Even his anger is expressed through passionate love towards justice and righteousness. Very complex situation. He gives love freely to those people that curse him. He lets them live and enjoy his creation in liveliness. Sometimes we wonder, oh, this person did bad things. How, what's God doing? Well, he loves, so he's going to give them a chance to have their livelihood. But there's a price in the end that most people know about already, you know. He freely loved all cultures by extending himself not only to the Jews, the people he had chosen to love in the beginning, but now to the whole world by giving up his own essence, his son as a propitiation for our sin. So he freely loves those that seek him. And to us, he gives his love freely, and not only his love, but we get bonuses. We get his spirit and his presence. Because when we seek him, it proves that we are nurturing our relationship with him. So, the love is freely the same for every human being from God, but to those that know God intimately, he dwells with them and in them. So now we have access, if we, if we are seeking him now, we have access to his joy, peace, and happiness like the other people will not have that. God shows us exactly what mature and perfect love is like, and this is it. I am loved because I love. God can say that about himself. He is loved because he first loved us. This kind of love says, I need you because I love you, not I love you because I need you. God can say this about himself. He can say he needs us just because he loves us. He shows us a different way to love than we practice right now on earth. So it goes like this. He loves, then we understand the magnitude of his mercy, and it produces love in us. And then we love, and we serve because we love. So, for those people that may not understand the faith and the works verse in the Bible, 
We produce works because of the love we feel for God. The laboring now is kind of like a condiment to the relationship and not out of our own self-deprivation. And don't get me wrong, you know, self-deprivation is biblical, but a lot of us love by depriving ourselves of joy and happiness. The Bible teaches self-deprivation in a different sense, coming out of the world, living a life holy and acceptable to God. What I'm focusing on is not that. What I'm saying is you're depriving yourself of joy and happiness when you say you love, which is not good. That is not true love. Love produces more of itself. If you feel miserable about doing good things, you either need deliverance prayer or you need to really check your motives. Is it selfish? You know, things like this. And this is the perfect example of Jane that we spoke about. Right? So I want to tell you a little story, not a little tidbit from my life. This is about me and my mom. My mom and I were pretty much best friends. We did everything together. She was a single parent, so she was always my Valentine. We did everything together. And what I wasn't noticing was the way she was loving. And I, I didn't notice it until I left her home. And what would happen is that whenever she had fits of anger and she got upset, she would tell me, look at all the sacrifices I made for you. Look at all the things that I did, that I put down my, I put down my life, I sacrificed my happiness, I don't have this or that, and all the people are going to parties, I got to be here with you. And that's how she expressed her disappointment with life. Now, this did not produce more love in me at all, because as I grew older, I started to understand that maybe she was miserable because of me. You know, I started to feel guilty. I started to blame myself. And that's a good example of what happens when we as women, especially if we have children, practice depriving ourselves of our own joy and happiness, thinking that our children will make us happy. So you see, we can shift into different people, and that's the problem. The Bible tells us God loves a cheerful giver. So it tells us something. we got to be cheerful when we're giving. You know, when we truly love, we give out of our aliveness. That's why it's important to fill your time up. We give out of our own joy, interest, understanding, knowledge, humor, sadness. We can even share our sadness and still produce love in someone else. When we do this, it enriches the other person and enhances their sense of aliveness. So now both people are experiencing that joy and love. So if you ever get anything that I said, remember this. True love encourages you to preserve your own energy and individuality. Sometimes in relationships, we think we have to blend in with the other person. In the beginning of my marriage, I thought becoming one flesh was becoming my husband. And I would tell him, I can't do that. We're two different people. I started to get frustrated. But then, you know, the Holy Spirit teaches you all things. Eventually, I would pray a lot, you know, and ask him like, to show me. Because I was far away from my parents. I didn't know. So he started to show me that you don't have to become a different person to become one flesh. 
you just become one with your husband in the way that you are to, you're in agreement with each other, but you're still preserving your individuality. You can still have your own interests, your own hobbies, you know. So that's a good thing for any young, really, <laughs> young moms or people that just got married. Hey, true love is not just an activity, it's an action that we need to constantly practice with our own free will. And this is what Carol was saying earlier. It's an action word. She was on point with that. It is never compulsive because there are no other motives behind it but to bring the same joy you have to someone else. God so loved the world that he gave of his own essence that one day we can turn away from wickedness and cultivate a relationship with our Father in heaven and experience the same joy and love that he has and that he is. He gave his son. So before we go, let's look at how we can use what we have discussed to overcome fear and insecurity and enhance communication in our relationships. Because a lot of what we talked about was the bulk of it. If we can learn to master these things, self-evaluation, responsibility, and true love, we can have excellent communication with anyone that we meet, with anyone in our lives. But we're going to see how it relates to fears and insecurities. And I have another board here. So, I hope it's not too confusing. <laughs> okay. Overcoming fears. Overcoming fears means building trust that you can handle anything. You need to know that whatever comes your way, whatever it is that you're afraid of, you can always handle it. Remember that when you are weak, God is strong. He dwells in you. And that he is in you, he that is in you is greater than anything in the world. So you have God's strength in you. You, don't, you do not need to fear. Okay? Self-awareness, remember, self-evaluation, to be more aware of you. When you're more aware of your attitudes and all your insecurities, you can make a list when you go home. These are my insecurities. Write them out so that you will know. Because sometimes we're blind to a lot of things when we don't put them on paper. When you're aware of your insecurities, you can fix them. Now you can focus on them. Okay, I, I get very impatient at times, and I do. I, get, I have four young children, but God is so good that he's been teaching me a lot of patience. And sometimes we're at the point, me and the Lord, we're at the point where when my children get me upset, I feel that I feel that anger and that impatience. I can now recognize it. And in my mind, I'm telling myself, I'm, I'm impatient, I'm upset, I'm upset. And now I can choose what I do with that. I can either say, look, I can, I can flip out on my children, or what I've been doing is just trying to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Liana, why did you put that there? Do you know what that makes mommy upset? Don't do it again. She'll say, sorry, mommy. It helps you a lot when you just put your insecurities and your shortcomings on paper and then try to improve them. That is the way you overcome insecurities. When you're aware that you have them, you can deal with them. When you can deal with your insecurities, you're more open to love. 
because love makes more love. So you will have that ripple effect on anyone that you meet. When you can love, you're acting responsibly most times. When you're loving, you're aware of everything that you're doing and saying, so there's responsibility. Overcoming fear, giving, giving love voluntarily. When you overcome your fears, you don't have to be afraid of expressing yourself. If it's bothering that we're talking about, and she's afraid to speak to someone, you know, she will, if she overcomes those fears, she will be able to be that, you described it, uh, wild personality. <laughs> You'll be able to bring that to the other person and you make them laugh or you share that love that you have with them when you overcome their fears. Insecurities that I've learned, they come, they, they're not just in a, a loving, like a husband and wife relationship. Sometimes they're, they're deeper than that. Me and my mother, we never had a mother-daughter relationship. And people think that's odd, but it's a lot of people that didn't have a mother-daughter relationship. That I've learned, you know, even though we love each other, the words didn't come out on a normal, I love you, but we didn't have that. Her and my sister had a loving mother relationship, you know, mother daughter relationship. And the guy has fixed that to a point that um, she got sick and everything. And I've always had her business. You know, that that part she, she liked about, you know. Yeah. But sometimes secrets and lies can be so deep that you know that it causes insecurity from from the past and carries over into whatever. But we've had mother daughter uh, days, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and God has um, fixed it for me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's awesome because, um, you know, that's an experience in itself. And, and it causes those kind of things, you know. I'm like waiting for my mom to say, now they're going to love me. But my brother said, I don't know if my mom will love me. I said, well, she was. I thought I was on one film. But my mother's not that type of person. I mean, she's a Christian and everything, and she does lovable things and all those kind of things. Yeah. But um, people go to the, I love you, I love you. I'm also, and I'm kind of like that too. And I think my brother does too. That's why we can recognize that. Yeah. Because we're like that. You know, we're like that too. We can overcome any experience. Any That's right. We can understand that well, our dads or our moms, they probably weren't even loved by their parents. There's always a reason why these things happen. Like for me, I had to understand that my mom was just, she was just consumed in her own world for the most of the time. And so when I started to understand what she was going through, especially when I when I had my first set of children, because I had twins first. So when I became a parent and something happened, I would see her react. I don't know how this happens, but I would <laughs> see her reaction if my reaction paralleled it. If I did something and she would do it, in my life, I would be aware of it. And I would think, oh no, I'm not going to my mother. <laughs> yeah. But it really helped me to understand how she felt back then. And so when you understand someone different, you can really have compassion on them. You know, they didn't mean to hurt you. They didn't mean to cause scars that would take years to go away. Sometimes they had, they probably had problems with their relationship with God too. He wasn't able to make any changes in their lives because they never submitted to him. You know, when we think about these things, we can truly understand our insecurities and mend it by ourselves with God, you know? 
it's not too big for it. And a lot of what a lot of what it involves, Judy was talking about forgiveness. So forgiveness is something easy. You just do it. <laughs> you just forgive. Now the feelings won't disappear. That's the hard part. To say that you're forgiving them and then you still feel a little bit of resentment in there. You gotta pray about it. And ask the Lord to take it away from you eventually, you know. But for the most part, you just do it. The same thing with fears. To overcome a fear, you just do it. Right, Laban? If you're nervous and you're fearful, I mean, right now, <laughs> I've been, this is my first presentation, and I was very nervous this morning. But when I saw Carol come in, I just did it. <laughs> I said, she's a lovely person. I'm going to love these women. They're, they're women. They're supposed to be good to each other. And we're supposed to share love with each other. I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to be fearful. See, I came with no expectations. <laughs> and that's really key. Because if you have expectations like, what was her name? The uh, Joe, Jane? Yes. Jane wanted her husband to just listen and she's going to unload on him. And that was her expectation. Yes. And he didn't. And she had a meltdown. Exactly. So what if I had come in here and I thought, you know, it should be a certain way. And I came in and I had no expectations. Like, right. I, and God showed me that years ago. You have so many, you have a lot less disappointment when you have, don't lower your expectations. Because when you lower your expectations, then that's still an expectation. Well, it's never going to amount to what I want it to be, so I'll just lower that. No, you just get rid of it. You just get rid of it. And that way you can always enter into any situation with what the Lord has for you. And not what you thought you should have for you. That's true. What's that scripture? Uh, uh, yeah, you know, and I used to be have my fears. I was like, yeah, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm afraid of evil. And then they were saying, what are you saying? There ain't no reason to say it against the good things today. You just don't know the <laughs> And I'm not in the death, you know, or nothing like that. But, you know, in our minds, we have we have things going on in our minds that take us places. You know, yes. I'm a music person. My wife. My life is in music, in music, and, and you, you know, church music, all kinds of music. You know, I can go to the church; and it brings the joy to me. You know, or I might cry about it because that is my life story. When I hear those words, I like the the, 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 the literature, yeah, the words that right there. I like that kind of stuff. I'm that kind of music. I don't like to hear no noise. I don't like to hear no. <laughs> Bunch of beat and how and screaming, you know, all that other stuff. I wanted yeah. some literature in there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, ladies, I just want to finish up this board. <laughs> and we have one more board to go to, and that's going to be about communication. And then we will close our presentation with prayer. All right? All right, we stopped at giving love voluntarily. Love produces more love. Now we have a sense of appreciation for others, other people's uniqueness. You know? Now we can understand people. Now we can relate to them. We need to understand that our fears, we share fears. A lot of the things that we experience, almost everyone else is experiencing them. So we feel alone because no one talks about it. But I guarantee you, everyone's got insecurities about themselves, their bodies, their appearance, their relationships, everything like that. But it depends on what you do with it. Everyone has fears. Before I got pregnant, I had a terrible fear of needles. One day, I just went in, I was cold sweating. I was sweating all over. They told me, your pregnancy is high risk, you're having twins. So they were drawing my blood as much as they can, running all sorts of tests. And one day I said to myself, I'm just gonna do this. I got twins on the way. I can't be afraid. 
I'm going to do this. So I went in. I was drenched in sweat. I put my arm out, and I just said, Lord, help me. <laughs> they did it, and since then, that fear is gone. Most of the time, to get over our fears, we need to just do it. Believe that we can handle anything that comes in our way. When we appreciate people, we have an understanding of them, and we can communicate better. We can be more open to love. We can be more considerate, because we can relate to them in some way or the other. Then it comes here. Congratulations. Now you can do what Jesus asks us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is big because a lot of the commandments hang on this one and the other one, the other two. Okay? Now you are in a way perfected in love. In some ways. Now this life is a journey. We're not going to be Perfect, perfected in love in every area of life, but in whichever one we work on and we become perfected in that love, we can overcome fear because the Bible says perfect love casts out of all fear. And then the cycle goes again and again with each insecurity you have, each fear you have, with that boldness that Christ has given you and his word, we can get through this life and we can get through it with joy and happiness and all gratefulness being good in all things the bible said it talks about women not only um getting salvation through childbearing but it says only if she continues in all goodness meekness all that all that other stuff that they talk about and that's what we're working on as babies Okay, so I hope that we can really make some changes in our lives. It doesn't matter if we can start small, but as long as we start somewhere, you know. And this is my last board for the day. It is communication between the sexes. Now, I made the communication part the last and the smallest topic because, as you ladies may have noticed, everything helps us to communicate better than we covered before. So we have covered all the things that will help us communicate better in our relationships. This one is the last one, and this one is geared specifically towards the males, our relationship with the males, okay? Now, I have made a few observations interacting with not only my husband, but brothers in Christ. You know, they don't have to be in Christ. I mean, I've, I've had interactions with lots of people, even if they weren't Christian. And I t I've taken a few things from them. And these are the things that I've taken from those interactions. Men and women are equals as opposite poles. Society teaches us that we are the same and communicate that we are the same, that we need to be the same to communicate. We are not the same, but we are one together. And this goes back to what I was talking about earlier when, earlier in my marriage, I thought that I had to be the same as my husband. And that's not, that wasn't working. We need to learn to be one with the men in our lives or the ones that we meet. And not the same. Society is telling us it's trying to make us less feminine so that it's telling us that the men of today they like women that are tough and you know that isn't the general consensus 
someone's making this stuff up because they're controlling the way the population grows. So now we have women walking around like men. They want to be like men, they want to speak like men, they want to act like men. It's taking us further and further away from our own nature, from who we really are. And even if you're a tomboy kind of person, you still have a feminine side, you know, that you, you can embrace whenever you want to. <laughs> On the other hand, society is telling men the same thing. I think we're going to experience, we're going to experience a rapid breakdown of communication, of relationships, and we're going to see a lot of depressed and unhappy people in our near future because no one knows who they are anymore and all the men are being fed this message where they need to become feminine to deal with women and it's not true they're not working on the communication they're working on changing the genders and that is something that we're going to have to deal with with our children and the next generation it's going to be tough but we have a good God. Okay. The first point I have here that I've learned is to know that silence is not a weakness. The Bible talks about silence as a woman. And I know that verse is used to make us feel bad all the time. But look, there is some truth to it. I see it as when we use silence during our communication or during our communicating, we can make others feel appreciated and we buy time to think about what they are saying and how they are feeling. We can also use that moment of silence to shuffle through our own feelings. What do we feel when they're saying what they're saying to us? 